Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar on enhancing health and safety in the homeless response system. My name is Natalie Matthews, and I'm just going to spend a very, very brief moment going over some logistics with everyone before we dive into the great content that we have for you all today. So uh, in terms of uh, logistics for today, just want to be clear that this webinar is being recorded and a copy of that recording along with the slides and a copy of the chat and Q&A content will all be posted to the HUD Exchange. Please do give us a few business days though and we will get it up to that website. Additionally, I uh, wanted to say that if you at any point have issues with your audio, we do find that um, calling in via your phone tends to be a better audio connection. You always have the option of switching from computer audio to uh, the phone number that is up there on the screen right now, and I will put that in the chat message uh, in just a moment if you don't have a chance to fully write it down. All participants uh, will remain muted for the duration of our time together today, but we do absolutely want to hear from you throughout the presentation. So, the best way to connect with us is going to be by going ahead and sending in chat messages. Please use the chat functionality to send questions, comments, feedback, suggestions that you have. Um, if you're not able to find the chat message quickly, just want to clarify where you can do that. On your screen, as you're seeing um, in the slide deck right now, you should see a row of several little icons. One of them is going to look like a chat or a message bubble. When you click on that, that'll open up the chat functionality for you. And when you are sending in those questions or comments, please take a moment to make sure that you are submitting them to all participants. Um, go ahead and look in the two box or the two line um, for the message and make sure that all participants is selected. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Norm Suchar from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. Norm? Thank you very much, Natalie. We have a great and very full agenda today. So I'm going to quickly introduce some of the speakers and some of the people that you will be uh, hearing either with the Q&A portion or uh, answering in the chat box. Uh, my name is Norm Suchar. I'm with the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, the SNAPS office uh, at HUD. Uh, we'll be joined by Rebecca Laws from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, their homelessness unit. Uh, Julie McFarland from Cloudburst uh, will be joining us as well. Shenandoah Gale uh, has a great presentation about the efforts of N Street Village uh, in Washington, D.C. Anne McCready from BCT Partners will be uh, presenting as well. Joel Hunt from the JPS Health Network in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, Lauren King from Tarrant County Homeless Coalition, uh, also in Fort Worth, Texas. Karen Cowell from All Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. Marlisa Grogan from the SNAPS office and David Canavan from Canavan Associates. Uh, you'll be hearing from uh, all of us, and we have a lot of great presentations, uh, several different community examples uh, that you'll be hearing from. So let's uh, advance to the next slide, please. I want to give an overview of uh, some of the uh, framing for the conversation today. So the CARES Act uh, obviously provided a lot of resources uh, with the goal of preventing, preparing for, and responding to coronavirus. Uh, over the course of the, uh, of the epidemic, uh, one of the things we've learned, something I think we knew beforehand, but it's very much been brought home as the disease has unfolded, is that the safest place for people to be during the epidemic is in housing. Uh, while the, our uh, shelters have done heroic work to uh, try and uh, implement protective measures and keep people spaced and uh, keep the disease from spreading, and outreach workers have done an incredible job uh, in encampments and other unsheltered locations that helping prevent the spread of coronavirus. Uh, there's no doubt that being in your own unit, in your own home, uh, is the safest place to be. So we've gained some important knowledge uh, since the pandemic began on how to reduce virus transmission uh, in the homeless response system, including in unsheltered locations, in uh, emergency shelters uh, and such. And uh, as cases are rising now in many states, uh, this knowledge and uh, the things we've learned are vital to share, and so this webinar uh, is intended to share those examples of how to implement uh, safer program practices in different parts of the homeless response system. So let's move on to the next slide, please. So uh, a few of the things we want to uh, strongly encourage uh, at a minimum 
Uh, CDC has provided some great guidance, uh, and we strongly encourage you to keep up with that guidance. They publish uh, updates on a very regular basis, uh, and uh, we encourage you to keep up with that guidance and implement the best practices uh, as much as you possibly can. It's also crucial to coordinate with public health and local health care providers uh, who are co coordinating the response across different sectors. Uh, and we need to just keep working to rehouse as many people experiencing homelessness as possible. Uh, we know that housing is a, uh, it will directly reduce the spread of COVID. Uh, and so the more work we do now to house people and to uh, keep them out of higher risk situations, uh, the less spread of COVID we're going to see in our community. So it's just a really important uh, and challenging uh, area. So moving on to the next slide, please. So our objectives today are going to be to advance our understanding of safer sheltering practices, to equip COCs and homeless assistance providers with the tools to respond to unsheltered homelessness uh, during the, the COVID pandemic, and to share emerging, emerging practices uh, from communities that are increasing the rate at which people are leaving non congregate shelters and going to housing. Next slide, please. So our agenda today, we're going to start off with a presentation uh, of recently released guidance from CDC. Uh, we're going to hear three community presentations, uh, one on safe shelter practices from M Street Village in Washington, D.C., uh, one on the street outreach efforts uh, going on in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, and one on rehousing strategies from Chicago, Illinois. We will have quite a bit of time for questions and answers at the end of that. I would encourage you to share your questions in the chat box as we go. Please make sure you have selected all participants. Uh, to send your questions. That way, all of the audience and the presenters can see the questions, uh, and will uh, and the rest of the audience will you know be able to share in uh, in what you're uh, learning there. Many of our presenters will also be in the chat box, and we have some people in the background uh, in the chat box to help answer questions. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Rebecca Laws from the. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, from their Homelessness Unit. So, Rebecca, the floor is all yours. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Laws. Um, I'm on the Homelessness Unit with CDC's COVID-19 response, and I'm happy to talk with you all today about some of the resources and updated guidance documents we've developed to help mitigate the effects of COVID-19 on people experiencing homelessness. Next slide. To provide some situational awareness, I wanted to first share the most recent COVID-19 case counts. So as of July 21st, there have been 3.88 million cases of COVID-19 reported in the United States. This graph shows the number of cases by day starting from late January through July 21st. And as you can see, the overall number of reported cases has been increasing in recent weeks. Next slide. And as you all know, continuing homeless services during community spread of COVID-19 is critical, and people experiencing homelessness are at risk for infection. It's important that homeless shelters not close or exclude people who are having symptoms or who test positive for COVID-19 without a plan for where these clients can safely access services and stay. And we try to emphasize with homeless service providers to coordinate with local health authorities when making decisions about whether clients with mild illness due to suspected or confirmed COVID-19 should remain in a shelter or be directed to alternative housing sites. Next slide. CDC has developed multiple guidance documents for people experiencing homelessness and homeless service providers. And these documents can be found on the CDC COVID-19 website in the section labeled Community Work and School, and all of the links are provided here. The first document listed is for shelters and other homeless service providers. This addresses issues related to providing services in congregate settings, and I'll walk through a few of these key considerations on the next slide. The second document addresses issues related to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, the third document is a checklist of considerations for homeless service providers as they reopen programs and facilities. 
The fourth is considerations for state and local health departments. And this document contains information on how to investigate and respond if a case of COVID-19 is identified in a person experiencing homelessness in your jurisdiction. And finally, the last is our newest guidance document, which was posted just this month. Um, and this document provides considerations for deciding when and how often to test um, or conduct testing in homeless shelters and encampments. And today I'll briefly walk through this guidance as well. Next slide. So I mentioned that I wanted to point out a couple of key considerations from our guidance for homeless service providers. Next slide. Uh, and specifically highlight some tips on facility layout. So you can use physical barriers to protect staff who will interact with clients with unknown infection status, uh, for example, check-in staff. Um, in meal service areas, uh, you want to create at least six feet of space between seats or allow food to either be delivered to clients or taken away by clients to eat at least six feet away from one another. And in general sleeping areas, for people who are not experiencing respiratory symptoms, try to make sure client spaces are at least six feet apart and align mats or beds so clients sleep head to toe. Next slide. So next, I'll discuss our interim testing guidance document, which describes scenarios when SARS-CoV-2 viral testing may be appropriate in homeless shelters and encampments. And please remember uh, that testing to diagnose COVID-19 is only one component of a comprehensive response strategy and should be used in conjunction with promoting behaviors that reduce spread, maintaining healthy environments, and preparing for when someone gets sick. And it's also important to remember that the considerations outlined in the guidance should always be reviewed in the context of local recommendations, resources, acceptability, and feasibility. So testing should be considered for the three groups listed here. First is people with signs or symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Second is asymptomatic people with recent known or suspected exposure to SARS-CoV-2 to control transmission. And third, testing can also be considered for asymptomatic people without known or suspected exposure to SARS-CoV-2 for early identification in homeless shelters and encampments. And this is based on the level of transmission within the community. And really the purpose and process of all testing and other public health activities should be clearly communicated to clients and staff at the homeless service site to promote understanding and acceptability. And in addition, testing strategies should be carried out in a way that protects privacy and confidentiality to the extent possible, and that is consistent with applicable laws and regulations. And any time a positive test result is identified, it's really critical to ensure that the individual is rapidly and appropriately notified separated from others, uh, provided appropriate medical care, and linked to appropriate alternative housing for isolation as necessary. Um, one additional point that's really critical to emphasize is that CDC does not recommend entry testing for homeless service sites and encampments. And we also want to emphasize that homeless shelters should not exclude people who are having symptoms or who test positive for COVID-19 without a plan for where these clients can safely access services and stay. Next slide. So the testing guidance document um, outlines how to use community transmission levels to guide which testing strategies to use for asymptomatic individuals. So for example, in areas where community transmission is none to minimal, Health departments should use their standard system and case investigation processes to identify confirmed and probable cases among people experiencing homelessness or homeless service staff. Alternatively, in areas where community transmission is minimal to moderate, health departments can also consider working with partners to increase testing access in homeless shelters and encampments to identify COVID-19 cases a little bit more proactively. And finally, in areas where community transmission is substantial, health departments may consider coordinating with partners to offer facility-wide testing for all clients, volunteers, and staff 
in all sites at least once. And this is regardless of whether an initial case of COVID-19 has been identified. And weekly follow-up testing of all previously negative or untested individuals is also recommended until the testing identifies no new cases for at least 14 days since the most recent positive result. Next slide. So next I will briefly mention some recent changes to the CDC guidance on discontinuation of isolation for persons with COVID-19. And note that this is not specific to people experiencing homelessness. Next slide. So for people who have tested positive for COVID-19, a test-based strategy is no longer recommended to determine when to discontinue home isolation, except in certain circumstances. And so what this means is that shelters should generally not require a negative test for readmittance. Instead, we recommend a symptom-based strategy, which is outlined here. So according to our interim guidance, medical isolation can end after all three of the following criteria are met. At least 10 days have passed since symptoms first appeared and no fever for at least 24 hours without the use of fever-reducing medications and other symptoms have improved. Alternatively, if the person tested positive but never had symptoms, we recommend that medical isolation can end at least 10 days since the first positive COVID-19 viral test, as long as the person has had no subsequent illness. Next slide. In consultation with infectious disease experts, a test-based strategy to discontinue isolation could be considered for people who are severely immunocompromised. And as mentioned previously, for, any, for everyone else, a test-based strategy is no longer recommended, except in situations where it may end isolation earlier than the symptom-based strategy. Next slide. And I'll close by talking about some of our other materials and opportunities. Next slide. So outside of the actual guidance documents themselves, the Homelessness Unit has developed additional tools and resources. And these can be found on our resources landing page, which is listed here. This includes a training for homeless shelter workers, which covers some basics of COVID-19, discuss, discusses some of the changes to facility layout and procedures, and has some information on helping sick clients and cleaning and disinfection. We also have an infection control inventory and planning or ICIP tool, which is basically a facilitated guide to open up conversation about COVID-19 infection control planning within a facility. And we also have an FAQs document, uh, communication materials, a list of extra precautions for people experiencing homelessness, a symptom screening tool, and a fact sheet with youth-focused information. Next slide. Finally, I wanted to mention two opportunities for participation. The first is a survey we are conducting among shelter workers, and we are specifically recruiting people who work at shelters where there have been COVID-19 cases among shelter workers. So if you're aware of any shelters who may be willing to participate, um, please email the email address here, eocevent 366 at cdc.gov. And the second is our universal testing dashboard which is a collaborative project between CDC and National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Next slide. So we have partnered to collect data from universal testing events at shelter or encampment-based service sites during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, data collection started in May and is ongoing. Next slide. So this is just a screenshot of the dashboard, which went live a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and shows descriptive data and results of testing events. And the link is posted here as well, if anyone would like to explore. Examples of data included are the number tested, positivity by state, shelter types where testing occurred, why the testing occurred, and testing information broken down by race and ethnicity. So if you or one of your partners have conducted a universal testing event and are not represented here, please consider adding to the data collection tool, which is on the website as well. These figures will be updated as new data emerge and more participation will provide key data to help us 
better understand the impact of COVID-19 on this population and provide future guidance. And we're especially trying to get more demographic data related to these testing events. Next slide. So with any questions about these two opportunities or for any other questions at all, the homelessness unit for CDC's COVID-19 response can be reached at any time by emailing uh, the email address here, eocevent 366cdcgovernor I think so much. I'll hand it back over to you, Norm. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, one of the questions that came up, if you don't mind me following up really quick, one of the questions that came up is you mentioned that uh, some of the guidance is dependent on the local circumstances as far as community transmission. How would somebody find out about what their local circumstances are with respect to community transmission? Yeah, that's a great question. It comes up all the time. So that would be determined in conjunction with um, the local health department. They would be able to determine um, basically if the jurisdiction is in um, low to moderate, moderate to medium, um, or minimal to moderate, or, or substantial community transmission. Great. And uh, we had another question about the, so you talked about the guidance on, the new guidance on isolation and positive testing no longer sort of being like the key marker there. Uh, do, is, so in, in the homelessness context, does that mean that someone who's been placed in, say, a hotel room or non-congregate sheltering for isolation, that it's okay for them to come back to shelter once those, you know, a shelter that may be sort of a very congregate environment? Uh, that that will be a safe uh, situation if, if those criteria you mentioned are met? That's exactly right. Um, and, and so uh, as long as, so basically what we are recommending now is a switch to the symptom-based strategy. So if someone meets all three of those criteria on the symptom-based strategy, um, unless they are severely immunocompromised and that's been in consultation with an infectious disease expert, um, then we would recommend that they can discontinue their isolation and go back to the shelter. Um, and this is really um, in relation to just our accumulating uh, knowledge base and evidence around ending isolation and precautions. Um, and really, we, we've, we've come to find out that concentrations of SARS-CoV-2 um, RNA decline substantially after onset of symptoms. Um, and so that, that by that time, after 10 days, um, the risk of transmission is very low. Great, thank you very much. Uh, that's a great update. Uh, so now we're gonna turn things over. I have a, I wanna introduce a few guests to, who are gonna talk about uh, sh implementing uh, safe shelter strategies. Uh, so we have Julie McFarlane, Anne McCready, and Shenandoah Gale. And I think I'm gonna turn things over first to uh, Julie to get us kicked off, Julie. So, hi everybody. HUD has published a new resource called Shelter Management during an infectious disease outbreak. And we're gonna go through some of the highlights within that document and we'll also link it for you in the chat box. So screening for symptoms is hugely important at shelter intake since testing continues to be so limited throughout the country. We just heard about that. Um, separating people who are symptomatic and following protocol established by the CDC for social distancing for all people, symptomatic and asymptomatic, continues to be the recommended process or, or practice, excuse me. We also just heard pretty extensively from Rebecca about uh, testing. The HUD resource also encourages partnerships with public health to implement a testing strategy and organize ongoing testing events. Adjusted operations continue to be critical, which means extensive cleaning schedules, use of any and all outdoor spaces that are available, and offering access 24 hours a day so people have safe places to be and aren't further putting themselves and others at risk by searching for safe uh, spaces in the community. Next. The non-congregate uh, sheltering through sites like hotels and dorms, also known as NCS, this should continue for the foreseeable future. These spaces should provide quarantine to people who are most at risk of COVID severe impact and isolation for those who are COVID positive but do not require hospitalization. And finally, shelters need to continue to operate with low barriers so everyone has options for safety and we don't risk further avoidable spread. 
This means that negative test results uh, should not be a precondition of enrollment, which Rebecca mentioned as well. Um, and in partnership with a larger community, you need to have a plan for where people can safely be when they have symptoms or test positive. Something we're gonna focus on pretty extensively today is uh, what we uh, see as the very best option, and that is quickly rehousing people into their own safe space. Next. The, the work has been incredibly difficult to date, and sustaining adjusted operations presents daily challenges. Shelters often have limited supplies and teams are more and more fatigued from this nonstop disaster response. Sustaining staffing is a real challenge. And so it's really important uh, that we acknowledge this because it's part of the daily grind to get safety through, to get uh, safely through this pandemic. Closing a shelter during a public health outbreak has the potential to increase the stress and the challenges that homeless systems are facing. Closing safe spaces like shelters right now poses really serious health implications for people experiencing homelessness and can contribute to increased disease spread in the community. We're seeing serious spikes in cases and we cannot close safe spaces at this time. Shelter providers really should not be on their own in this effort and we've seen many COCs actively reaching out to shelters and acting as kind of a centralized type of hub for documenting resource needs and problem solving to get the necessary resources into shelters. So if a shelter is considering uh, closing down, there are some steps that you can take. Let's go to the next one. Number one is really about reaching out to your local public health partners and your emergency management partners to determine if staffing and supply resources can be lo uh, locally accessed. Ensuring that partners understand the community ramifications for closing these sites is really, really critical and we really can't uh, state this enough. Number two would be to create or continue your non-congregate sheltering options, those hotels, those dorms, et cetera, to decompress your congregate shelter spaces. And then three, there is TA available to you. We really encourage you to reach out to HUD or your field office or through the AAQ and we can get you connected to some folks who can uh, potentially help in this situation. Next. All right, so we're gonna spend the rest of the time uh, hearing from communities that are in the trenches and uh, like Norm said, we'll have Q&A uh, at the end for the most part. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anne to do some introductions and we'll get started. Thank you so much. So I have the privilege of working with M Street Village, which is a Washington DC based nonprofit organization providing housing, shelter and supportive services to women experiencing homelessness. Um, one of their programs that we're gonna focus on today is called Patricia Handy Place for Women, which is a 213 bed uh, congregate shelter that includes low barrier shelter, transitional sh shelter, medical respite, um, and a residential program for senior women experiencing homelessness. I am pleased to be joined by Shenandoah Gale, uh, who is their Director of Evaluation and Learning. Next slide, please. So you may have seen uh, this resource uh, came over one of the beautiful listservs that we all are on and sometimes glaze over, but hopefully you didn't glaze over this story. It came out uh, about two weeks ago um, and like most communities, DC has been working to um, prevent the spread in congregate shelter. And um, the DC Department of Human Services designed and implemented a strategy to engage and collaborate with shelters uh, to modify their procedures, to rapidly respond to positive cases, and to conduct mass testing uh, to identify asymptomatic carriers. Uh, collecting data on a daily basis was a key component to this strategy, uh, and it really required the mobilization of shelter providers to uh, engage with people on a daily basis and provide that data back to the district on a daily basis. Um, the result has been, uh, at least at this point of the last update of this tool, was that there were zero positive cases of staff and clients in the mass testing that occurred during June. Um, and so that was a, a really strong success for them. Next slide, please. So Shenandoah brings to us today the uh, explanation of what was it like as a shelter team to go to collecting data daily. So 
Janet Doe, thank you for joining us. And um, can I turn it over to you to sort of tell us, walk us through what did it mean to start collecting data daily? Sure. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, it's a pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. Um, so early on, we, um, we got a request from the District of Columbia Department of Health Services, of Human Services, um, requested again that we, the shelter providers collect key health data about each resident daily and to send that data to the district on, um, at, by one o'clock each day. We didn't um, have a, a routine of doing daily data collection to that degree. Um, and so uh, we, to facilitate the, the collection, we built this tool. You're not gonna be able to see it. Um, it's, it's really quite small and it is anonymized, but um, my understanding is it will be a product that you'll be able to receive at some point um, as, uh, by participating in this uh, webinar. So we created this tool um, and we, uh, this is uh, built on the bed list from the low barrier shelter. Um, and we built it so that it could be printed out um, and taken around uh, for ease of use um, by shelter staff or at some point also um, nurses were provided by the District of Columbia. So it was a tool that they could also use. It took us um, about two weeks of trying, of iterating the tool between um, our data team and the shelter staff um, to come up with this final version um, that you see here. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So Shannon Doet, as you referenced, yes. um, there's this, um, there was this iteration process. And I love that about your all story because in these moments, it is, um, sometimes people think it has to be perfect to, to be, you know, what is that phrase? Perfection becomes the enemy of the good. Um, can you walk us through, in addition to sort of iterating the tool, what were some other lessons that you learned through the process? Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, there were several, there were these three key things that we learned. One is um, we wanted to be clear on the, the purpose of the tool um, be, because of the conditions under which um, everyone was working, right? That initially the tool, we tried to capture additional administrative data points desired by the, um, by Entry Village, by management, um, but it wasn't, data that was necessarily required by the district. Um, and during that iterative process, um, we determined that we wanted to really be as simple as possible, clean as possible with the data that we were collecting and why we were collecting it. Um, so we eventually took off the uh, administrative data that we were looking for. Um, a second uh, key learning is to keep it simple. Um, and this is because at, at times we weren't sure uh, because we're working remotely and because things change on um, such a, a rapid basis in the low barrier shelter context and with the, with the COVID situation, we were not always sure who was on the other end of our email request um, uh, it, that morning, right? Who was gonna fill out the tool? Um, we didn't know if it was going to be temp staff or um, it might have been a staff person that was covering for another staff person who isn't usually in that role. So we really, we really wanted to, to keep it simple and the person picking up the tool and entering the data, you know, they may have stepped into that role for the first time that day. And so it really had to be um, intuitive and pretty straightforward. And then a third learning was um, to create a, an information or a feedback loop. So we got the data from the, the, our staff colleagues, um, usually by about 11. Um, we compiled that data, sent it back out to the city, but we also offered it back to our colleagues who had provided us the data that morning. And um, we did get the feedback from them that it was quite a quite useful tool for them in the midst of um, all the things that they were keeping track of, it was a really helpful way for them to um, be able to see any changes in their census that may have happened that day. Thank you, next slide. Um, so I love that you touched on in your key lessons learned that 
you know, the use of tent staff, because we are definitely hearing that across the community. Um, your, I know your, your shelter staff have had to go on on a several waves of isolation and quarantine because of positive cases in the shelter early on. So you were using mm -hmm. other staff. Um, can you talk a little bit about the communication strategies that worked well for you all during this period? Sure, sure. Um, before the pandemic, we, um, and Street, um, was, we were in the process of transitioning to a platform to facilitate communication for a dispersed um, workforce. Um, but we, we had, didn't quite roll it out fully before COVID hit. So um, there, wasn't, there wasn't time to become, there wasn't a uh, relaxed time to become familiar with a new, new tool. And so it became evident that the moment called for a more expeditious and familiar way of communicating uh, with our staff colleagues or our temp colleagues. Um, and that was um, good old fashioned emailing or text messaging. And then um, again, because we weren't really clear um, always because of our remote work status, we weren't always clear what was happening that particular day um, and so, or where staff were. So it, it was really important for us to, um, you know, be sort of to be ginger and graceful about our reaching out and asking for the data and, and sensitive to what was happening on the ground and really, um, uh, um, be um, mindful of that in our communication. And so we would, it wasn't clear if a staff colleague was in isolation in, um, or in quarantine, if they were working, you know, if they had just come off of working double shifts or not. And so we just, we just would start out a text message with, or an email message of, are you on duty at the moment? If, if not, is there someone else that we could, we could talk with? Yeah. I think that is, uh, we talk a lot about giving each other grace in these moments. I love that that was part of your story. Next slide, please. Um, one of your colleagues, uh, the manager of Low Barrier Shelter, um, Nicole Hall, helped prepare the uh, written profile that will be up on the HUD Exchange in the near future that also includes that template, the bed check template that you referenced earlier. Um, and she helped prepare that document, wasn't able to be on the webinar today, but I just want to reference with you that she also helped prepare some of these additional lessons learned. Um, and I liked that uh, as you walk through them, they'll seem familiar from some of the advice that we got uh, from Rebecca with the CDC presentation just a few minutes ago. Um, do you want to walk us through additional lessons learned? Sure. Um... Yes, yeah, so our colleague Nicole Hall lifted up these um, additional strategies. So, um, and that is uh, first off, personal protective equipment. Um, staff were required to wear PPE, and residents encouraged, uh, and, and residents were encouraged. And staff estimated that mm, about 50% of residents utilize the PPE regularly or effectively. Uh, a second strategy is moving to a 24-hour schedule. So before COVID-19, uh, only residents in medical respite beds stayed in during the day, but now all residents um, stay at the shelter all day and they receive uh, meal services there. Uh, a third strategy is to ask for resident feedback. The shelter had a structure in place um, for weekly dorm meetings where residents were invited to share concerns and feedback. These continued in a, a socially distant manner and invited residents to provide ideas for improving the experience. Um, and then a, a fourth shift, which we all did, was um, uh, shifting to virtual. And what that looked like in uh, Patricia Handy Place for Women Low Barrier Shelter was shifting case management to phone or video platform to reduce exposure for residents and staff. And then a last strategy um, was to trust staff to make good decisions. And in particular, um, the N Street Village leadership was asked uh, whether staff were quote unquote allowed to participate in, in um, protests or other large group events that were happening right outside the door of the shelter and in our city. Um, and the message from our CEO was that um, she trusted the staff to weigh the risks and to take as many precautions as possible. 
to protect the community. And again, here, Nicole Hall um, uh, said that the shelter staff uh, don't, that they don't want to put the residents at risk and they recognize the stress it caused to the team when staff had to be out on isolation or quarantine. And so she feels that staff are making choices for the, not just for the individual, but for the good of the community. Shenandoah, thank you so much for sharing your story with all of us. We appreciate the work you all are doing um, and sharing about the use of data and how that a new strategy was implemented during really difficult times. Um, I think with that, we're turning it back over to you, Julie. Or thank you. Yeah. Right. Yes, thank, thank you. you. I just wanted to uh, follow up a little bit with the, uh, there was a question in the discussion in the chat that I wanted to just follow up on regarding testing at shelters and uh, sort of a required testing at shelters and under what circumstances and such. And one of the sort of uh, legal things I wanted to bring up is that uh, CARES Act funds actually prohibit any sort of prerequisites from, for entering shelter. Uh, so, for example, you wouldn't be allowed to require a test uh, for somebody to be able to enter a shelter that is uh, supported with CARES Act funding. Uh, that said, uh, it, you certainly uh, are welcome to offer tests. Uh, and, you know, obviously, if there are people who are sort of visibly showing symptoms, uh, consult with your public health officials about how to handle those situations. Uh, but also, you know, I think the, if, if the scenario is that uh, you offer tests to people and if they test positive, you have a nice isolated space for them to go to. Uh, in my experience, most people like that deal uh, relative to sort of the congregate environment. So, uh, you know, hopefully that's something you can sort of work out. Uh, but just wanted to, to give that a uh, little bit of context there. Uh, we are going to switch now over to uh, talk about unsheltered strategies, and uh, we're going to hear from some uh, folks in Fort Worth. I will say that uh, one of our guests from Fort Worth will probably have to jump off right after the presentation. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, jot them down in the chat box, e uh, even as the presentation goes, and we'll probably have a short uh, question and answer session with them uh, immediately following their presentation. So. Uh, I'm going to, I'd like to introduce Lauren King and Joel Hunt from Fort Worth. They're going to be, again, talking about their unsheltered strategies. And Julie, I'm going to turn things over to you to frame up the issue. Julie? Okay, thanks so much. So let's jump into unsheltered responses. And frankly, this is something we haven't talked about enough. And so I am really excited about that presentation today and hearing from Fort Worth and how they have um, sustained and scaled up their uh, response to people who are living in unsheltered situations. Rebecca already mentioned in the um, CDC guidance that we heard, but uh, we really want to emphasize this. While outdoor settings may allow people to increase their physical distance between themselves and others, sleeping outdoors often does not provide protection from the environment nor does it provide adequate access to hygiene and sanitation facilities or connections to services and healthcare, all of which are particularly critical right now. In some communities, we saw the initial guidance to not sweep or clear encampments actually be misinterpreted as leave people outside alone, and that meant not continuing or um, scaling up outreach efforts to keep people outside as safe as possible. However, we have seen some communities really scale up their outreach efforts, and we're going to hear from Fort Worth on that today. What we need to emphasize now, especially with the current COVID-19 spikes, is that clearing encampments can cause people to disperse throughout the community and break connections with service providers. And this obviously increases the potential for infectious disease spread, which is exactly the opposite of what we're all working hard to avoid. I want to run through just a few quick uh, critical strategies and then hand it over to Lauren. So first, we've got to maintain strong communication with people who are living outside, and that, that approach can be greatly strengthened by utilizing a peer navigation model, uh, paying people with lived expertise to do outreach and engagement within encampments. We need to use uh, health messages and materials that have been developed by credible health sources like your local and state public health departments or the CDC, and we've got to keep the educational info flowing. 
So posting signs in strategic places like near hand washing facilities that provides instruction on hand washing and cough etiquette is still as critical as ever. Make sure that your educational materials about COVID-19 are translated for non-English speakers and also written for people with lower literacy or intellectual disabilities and accessible also to people who are hearing or vision impaired. Get info to people about the changes in policies within your homeless system or changes in physical location of services like food, water, hygiene facilities, the healthcare uh, access or behavioral health resources. Um, I know that was a really, really important early on and we've got to keep that information uh, flowing since things are still changing regularly. Ongoing screening and education within encampments is also critical and we're going to hear more about that in a few seconds in terms of a really great partnership with a street medicine team. Specifically, if you have an opportunity to partner with street medicine um, or public health in that way, that is huge. Uh, a strong continued collaboration with public health and health officials is obviously critical and it shouldn't end within this response, but this should really just be the beginning of a critical and ongoing partnership that we can begin to plan for and foster now. All hands on deck is really critical um, to screen, to transport, and to connect people with medical units as needed, and also to quickly connect people to permanent housing as those resources become available. So let's go to the next slide and I'm going to turn it over to Lauren King um, and to Joel Hunt to talk about how they're doing things literally um, on the streets with people who are living outside and from a policy perspective at the COC level around how they're ensuring people have access to housing resources quickly. Thanks, Julie. All right. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> So um, to give you all some context about our um, our situation, so we actually had seen, um, before we even took the hit, we had seen a 43% increase in our unsheltered homelessness from the previous year. Um, so we had seen a significant uptick there um, and knew that we had to uh, address that. Unfortunately, we actually um, lost an outreach team last year, so we saw a huge decrease in the number of outreach workers we were having. So um, in looking at um, how our, what our response was, we really, um, we're at a disadvantage there. Um, a number of our outreach teams are very specific. So um, as Julie mentioned, we have a medical um, a street outreach team who specifically deals with medical. Um, we have a behavioral health outreach team who only deals with behavioral health. Um, and then our other outreach team, or actually it's one person that is specific is um, from the VA, um, specifically does veterans. So she's general outreach connects to housing, uh, but she is limited to veterans. So we only had um, one team that was general outreach, and I believe that they were at the time four people. So we were really struggling with that. So to kind of give you some context of where we were, um, we saw our outreach, our outreach workers kind of go through that. Early on, um, I will say our community had great collaboration and coordination. We put out a lot of communication for both um, our outreach teams and shelters and housing programs. Um, specifically with outreach teams, we use the CDC guidance to create different um, different publications for them that they can include, um, they could give to campers. Um, they also could include them in, you know, as they left hygiene kits behind and other resources, um, they would put that in, um, in a baggie or whatever they leave behind um, just to make sure they have that information. Um, they also regularly encouraged campers to space their tents out. I know, um, like they mentioned, it's obviously not ideal for anyone to be living outside, but if we can take those precautions, um, we did. Um, our city did work with us to um, stop clearing camps, so we were very um, uh, upfront, or we worked with them a lot on the fact that um, the goal right now is not to get people into more congregate settings. Um, so we worked with them um, quite a bit on how, uh, on just, you know, can we keep non-congregate, um, or keep congregate settings at um, a minimum, and how do we ensure the safety of everyone? Our outreach team did. We did. In the beginning of COVID, um, see a bit of a decline there because um, some were working the, um, spending part of their time working the overflow shelter that we set up. Um, but at this point, uh, I believe they're all back out in the field. So we, like I mentioned, we got early out, um, education outreach, work, outreach workers. The other thing the COC did is um, we began to serve as kind of a hub for tracking needs around their supplies and equipment. So we had all of our instead of our city and county having to um, communicate with the 40 different agencies we work with, um, we started to act as a hub and to really keep track of what people needed. 
Um, that was a good way for us too to be able to understand what their needs were and kind of what they were seeing on the streets. Um, early on, we went to a policy, um, I'll use policy loosely, um, that um, we wanted our entire population to be masked. So they were able to, our, even our outreach teams were able to give us a good idea of, you know, what people's reception was to that, um, how many masks they were going through, um, and that sort of thing. Um, like I mentioned, encampments were not moved or swept, so they, um, encampments were allowed to stay. Um, and then we have had a strong partnership. All of our outreach teams have had a strong partnership with JPS and our street medicine team. Um, we, early on as a COC, were actually having daily calls. So we would have a 30 minute huddle every morning just because things were changing so quickly. Um, we moved that to three times a week and now it's actually at one time a week. And it's just um, for people to update. Um, we have an update from public health and from our medical provider. And then all of the different um, interventions also give an update and can give announcements, ask questions, share concerns, that sort of thing. Um, so our street medicine team and Joel and um, another doctor had been on there from the beginning um, to give us the medical perspective and share information with us. Um, the other thing specific to outreach workers that we did was um, they began also having a phone call with just themselves. Um, I want to say three times a week, um, they began that to really strategize about who they were reaching, what they were seeing, did anyone need to be tested, um, going through just kind of where they were and what they were doing, what they were seeing. So um, that allowed our street medicine team to really be able to quickly respond um, if another outreach team had an issue. The other thing they have started doing as well is they choose one day a week and all go out together to, um, to a larger camp so that all of them can provide those comprehensive services to um, people who are living outside. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. And I'll go more into um, kind of more of our response and what we've done to increase our connection to housing there. Um, but that's, that's where we'll start. So I'll turn it over to Joel and let him talk about um, specific medical information. Joel, you might be muted. Yeah, sorry, it's Joel, it keeps going go. mute and unmute. All right, next slide, please. So, I mean, who is not tired of this pandemic? I mean, can I get an amen? Um, I think the the pandemic fatigue is is real, and um, it's something. <laughs> thank you, amen. Um, it's something that is just. It's taking a toll on on everybody, no matter what your um, profession or, or where you are. And certainly, in homelessness and homeless health care is is no um, no different. So I think recognizing that and and trying to stay the course of not being too rigid um, or or erode um, any kind of boundaries and um, maintaining maintaining that that humanistic. Um, uh, approach is is really important to to keep in mind throughout this. Next slide, please. So, um, in, in Fort Worth, when we were doing street medicine uh, before COVID, um, we keep a 90-day list of all the people that we're seeing, and, and if they're not seen within the 90 days, they fall off that list, not off our uh, radar, just off that specific list, and. It's more of a, of, a, of a management tool for us to, to plan, uh, but also gives us a pulse of sort of our census. And uh, before COVID, we had seen a, a kind of a little dip for reasons I, I don't know, down to about 100. We would often we see around 150 um, on that list. But right before COVID, I think it even dropped a little bit below 100. And then um, around March, uh, um, when we started getting back into back in the streets full time from setting up the emergency shelter, uh, we have just seen a, a peaked increase in in people experiencing unsheltered homelessness uh, to the tune of about 140. I think now, Julie, since we talked, 150 percent um, increase in um, in people sleeping outside, and, and we don't really have a good reason on why they're not people that are. Um, new to homelessness necessarily. They're not people that have lost housing or jobs related to COVID, but the need is there, the volume is there. And so the, the continued need for reaching them um, 
is certainly present and in our community anyway is growing. So staying safe, of course, uh, goes both ways. Um, we often talk amongst ourselves that we're as much of a threat to their safety as, as uh, they are to us in terms of spreading coronavirus. And so it's important that um, social distancing is, is practice and you can still have a conversation six feet away um, and mask to mask when, when at all possible, um, encouraging them to wear their masks. Of course, we wear our masks. Um, face shields and goggles are recommended. It's a little tricky on the street with noise and trying to talk through a mask and through a shield. <laughs> that makes it a little tricky, but um, in the right settings and, and certainly when we're uh, up close or in tight places, we, we, we wear that. And gloves, um, we don't make that a standard practice, um, but when we're um, handling um, people's belongings or things uh, that are, might be suspected, uh, or patients that are suspected of, of having coronavirus, of course, in room full PPE with gowns and everything, because um, gloves are just really a second layer of skin and um, can can still spread uh, when people touch their mask and stuff. And you just do it subconsciously. Um, and screening, we continue to screen, and, and both safety precautions and screening um, and education are things that I've noticed in our own team um, that we have to be consciously um, consistent about because it's easy to 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 wax on that. Um, but asking people those specific questions of new symptoms, new onset of, of cough, of uh, checking temps, asking the uh, the the right questions on the on the symptoms and doing the intakes and also um, yeah taking temperatures. Um, the other thing is remembering that um, though we are in this pandemic, people still get and have other illnesses as well, um, and not just being not having COVID brain and just only thinking about that, but working to help uh, treat those other chronic illnesses or acute illnesses, not only for their well-being but also to try to help relieve and keep them out of the the larger system, the larger health system, and out of the. Um, um, ERs and, and even clinics uh, when possible. That's not normally our, our mantra as street medicine, but um, certainly keeping people away from, from others as, as much as possible right now is, is the goal. So that's another great thing we're um, able to do. And then as Lauren had mentioned, the frequent involve, involvement and constant uh, communication with the, with the continuum of care and homeless services is absolutely um, imperative. And our phone calls have been um, I, I, that's been sort of the secret sauce, if I had to, if I had to say. Next slide, please. So to that point, um, the, the partnerships uh, that we have, like I said, is just absolutely critical. And we do, we do healthcare, uh, we do some behavioral healthcare, uh, but we don't, we don't, we don't do housing. Um, so partnering with those who do, uh, with the other agencies, is is incredibly important. Um, and we've, uh, from a kind of a higher level, have uh, partnered with TCHC on this project to prioritize people in, in our continuum, sheltered and unsheltered, um, who are at, at risk for um, poor outcomes should they, should they get uh, COVID-19. And uh, we've been able to do that through, uh, we have a, a homeless registry database at our health system, which is um, a, a collaborative Exchange of, of of information between TCHC to uh, to JPS, where we're able to to keep a list of of names of people experiencing homelessness, and um, and then we're that's the how we identify who's experiencing homelessness. And of course, we have the health records, and merging those two together, we were able to use kind of a um, pretty close to the Charleston comorbidity index, it's kind of a vulnerability index of, of poor outcomes of health, um, and using that with, with some weighted, um, weighted scoring on different categories, um, such as cancer, HIV, COPD, the, the illnesses, the chronic illnesses that um, really uh, predispose people to poor outcomes, age, and that's able to give us a number of, of severity of, of um, or likelihood of a poor outcome, and we can just uh, we give that that information with the patient's name and their score, not their health information, back to TCHC to to work on um, 
identifying and, and helping move those people into housing. I think that's it. For yeah, me. and I can add a little bit, to, Joel. If, um, I can add a little bit to that as well. So um, we another way we kind of, um, kind of build on that, I guess, is a couple of things. So. Um, the first bullet is that our partnership with our navigators. So we have advocated for, you know, everybody knows we have all this CARES money coming in with ESG. Um, and our municipalities could actually um, come to us, the DOC, and said, um, what are the system needs and where should we fund? Um, so we were able to help them figure out, based on all the resources coming into our community, uh, what was the greatest need and how should we use this? Of course, based on um, national guidance and some other things. But one thing that we advocated for was adding um, a number of housing navigators, so we call ours mobile housing navigators, who will actually be on the streets to connect unsheltered folks to, uh, to housing. So uh, those um, people will be actually embedded with existing outreach teams. So I mentioned that we had had a loss of outreach teams. This will help us bring back that general outreach and connection to housing. Um, so you can, we can still leave street medicine and um, psychiatric street care, um, to do what they do best. Um, and then we are, we are embedding mobile housing navigators with those teams to ensure that housing is always connected to any service they're providing. Um, other policy thing that we did was um, as a, the COC board actually voted to uh, make people at risk of COVID our priority population for this year. Um, so that means that people who are at risk of COVID-19 uh, are prioritized for housing in our system. So. Um, we are using the information that Joel talked about um, to actually do that. So um, managing it similar to um, a cohort list, um, like similar that you do with veterans or other, other special populations. So managing it somewhat like that um, and then um, moving people quickly into housing so that it, they're out of non-congregate and unsheltered situations. I think that's about it. Um, I think I'm turning it back over to Norm. Um, and I'm sure we can answer questions or um, anything that's yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Joel. Uh, just a quick question that came up. Somebody had a question about uh, using different structures. Uh, there, they had a specific suggestion, which I'm not sure I can pronounce, but um, like, you know, people have been experimenting, I think, with different kinds of, like, you know, I don't know, tiny homish kinds of things, but really much more basic and simple than that. Have you all looked at those kinds of things too uh, as, as part of your unsheltered strategy or your encampment strategy? So we sort of, <laughs> we've looked at all different kinds of strategies to um, do non-congregate shelter of some sort. Um, so, yeah, I would say we've started to look at that. We probably have other preferences, um, but mm -hmm. we haven't put anything in place specifically, but I would, the answer to that is sort of, I'm sorry, that's not a very good answer, but um, that's kind of where we are right now. Okay, and there was another question about the housing navigation. You mentioned that you uh, have created some positions uh, with the ESG funds. Are those positions you already had, or is that something sort of entirely new that you created? Um, so, kind of like a both and. So, in the midst of this, we also redesigned our coordinated entry system um, because we noticed some barriers and um, knew some things needed to change. So, we had system navigators in our system already. Um, and so, we actually transitioned those existing positions to be mobile housing navigators and specifically connect um, unsheltered people to, um, to housing. So we kind of changed how our system works. So we transitioned some existing positions to that. Um, and then in addition to, it'll be 14 additional like new personnel um, doing that same thing. And, and did you, how did you find people with the right skill set for that? Because we often hear that, you know, this isn't like regular case management or some of the social work that people do. There's a real sort of real estate function involved here. Uh, so, did you find that people had that skill set or you could teach it or did you have to go, have you been looking for people? Um, so, we will be looking for people. We're not finished hiring all of those. And I will say those are not Homeless Coalition employees. Um, we actually have providers who do that. But um, we have, since, navigate, since system navigation has come on board um, within our system because it is part of the coordinated entry function, um, the Homeless Coalition actually oversees all of the training and 
um, kind of sets the expectations and performance for that group um, so that across the community it looks the same. It's very um, consistent across. Um, so I'd say all of the above. We, uh, with our existing staff, um, they, they have experience in that. They have been doing that. Um, and then with this new staff, I think it'll be, I, I mean, I'm hopeful that it will be people who have experience placing people in housing and connecting people to housing um, that, that are wanting to move into a different position perhaps. So it definitely does take a, a very specific skill and, you know, that balancing of, I sort of have a caseload, but I'm not a case manager, and how do I, you know, what what does the warm handoff look like? Um, our redesign of coordinated entry was really looking to see um, how do we shorten that time. We found we had, that was one of our gaps in coordinated entry, and that it was taking a long time to connect to the housing program um, and really get the intake done and that sort of thing. And so our goal as a community is to significantly reduce that. Um, and so that's where those navigators play a key role. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Joel, uh, for sharing that information with us. We're going to uh, switch gears a little bit now. We're going to talk about, uh, we have a great presentation coming up on housing-focused uh, uh, work, helping people exit non-congregate shelter and uh, move to permanent housing. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce Karen Cowell from uh, All Chicago. Uh, and Julie McFarland is going to tee us up on the topic, so I'm going to turn things over to you, Julie. Okay, great. Thanks so much. So, uh, Lauren and Joel talked uh, about uh, how they have uh, utilized some strategies to really focus on rehousing, which is a great segue. Um, we know that housing people from the streets, from congregate shelters, and from NCS um, is really the best thing we can do to prevent further spread of COVID-19 among people experiencing homelessness. And we heard early on in this webinar people's concern about folks exiting NCS who had tested positive and going back to shelter and being certain that that was safe. And one strategy to really um, remedy that is to house people directly out of NCS, out of those isolation and quarantine op options. So we also, I really appreciate that Joel acknowledged COVID fatigue because that feels extremely real. And I'm sorry the animation didn't work. That was supposed to be a person falling face down on their bed, um, which feels, it just, it very much resonates. Um, we know folks have been in constant disaster mode and it is a lot to do all of this at once. And it's also the nature of this beast. So we wanna focus on what people have been able to do to date to get flow through their system because um, they are moving people into safe and permanent housing options. Establishing a rehousing plan is really critical and has to be done really quickly at this point so that the actual housing effort can begin. And all of this is really overwhelming, um, but we know we have to figure it out. So we're gonna get really concrete today on what can be done immediately. Next slide. We all are very clear about the spike. As of yesterday, we're experiencing a 30% increase in new cases over the previous 14 day period. And we know that this isn't letting up in the near term. So we've got to increase flow through NCS and our congregate shelter settings to ensure that ongoing availability for at-risk people. Um, and rehousing is really our best tool to accomplish that. We know that uh, homeless systems have worked endlessly to make changes to their facilities and to their practices and have been successful in reducing illnesses and deaths from COVID-19. And that effort has been nothing short of incredible. Um, communities have not yet largely ramped up their rehousing efforts. And we have this huge investment um, through ESG CV at our fingertips right now. So we've got to move on that. And we're going to hear how Chicago leaned into the fact that you can move forward um, with housing people and receive ESG reimbursement in the future. And we do recognize that there are cash flow issues in some states or localities that have slowed down these rehousing efforts. What I really want to highlight before turning it over to Chicago is an emphasis on systematizing your rehousing processes wherever you possibly can. If you can automate, if you can automate parts of the process, that reduces the work for your housing teams that provides a little bit of extra capacity to then support people for whom your system is not serving well. Maybe that's folks with higher housing barriers or more intensive service needs. We do know that every system has strengths. Maybe your landlord engagement work has been strong. You likely have some really good service providers that can house people quickly. 
whatever those strengths are, we're encouraging you to leverage them now and test a process that you believe may work for a large number of people. And you can then quickly learn from that test, refine your process, and scale up your rehousing effort. And that's what Chicago has really been um, successful in doing very recently. So let's go to the next slide, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Karen Cowell from Chicago, uh, from All Chicago, the CUC lead entity. We may need to go one more. Sorry about that. Yeah. There we go. Okay, one more from here. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. No problem. Thanks, uh, thanks, Julie. Yeah. Again, I'm uh, my name's Karen, and I'm from All Chicago. We're calling our rehousing strategy the Expedited Housing Initiative, and I'm the project manager. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to talk about is the state that I think everyone was in or is in, and is planning versus urgency, um, and how to balance those two. So, like everyone, when the CARES Act funding announcements came out, we were quick to. Uh, mobilize and determine what our strategy would be and what the cost of that strategy was going to be and taking that to the city of Chicago in order to have it as part of their um, strategy and their allocations. And so, um, you know, once we knew we would be part of that, we really like jumped into like planning of the entire initiative and how it would go. Um, and we were really excited about that. And then we, the reality hit us that it's going to take a long time to get this funding in our hands. So it felt like we were doing um, a lot of stopping and starting. And so the urgency of, of what we needed to do because rehousing people and having them in their own home was the safest option wasn't in alignment with how quickly we could get funding. And so, um, and we also were feeling from the community, Chicago, uh, our health department decided to use a shielding strategy. So we had about 130 to 100 folks in a hotel um, that were being shielded from COVID because they were high risk. And, you know, that, you know, it's, tiring to be in a hotel for a long time. And so um, how do we move people out? And then um, with all this planning and everything we're doing, and I, you know, I wanted to go too, because I, we felt like we had things in place and we were doing things that we wanted to test and to try. We were preparing providers and getting the team ready to go. And then, you know, what about the money? So I really like elevated these things as a project manager to the leadership at All Chicago. And we really started digging in to like what could be feasible and what could we do. And I mean, our leadership was really great of looking at um, what was possible. So we looked at our ESG caseloads for rapid rate housing and could we add some folks onto those? Well, we had identified an existing resource from the state that we could use for some of the rental assistance. So we really started moving towards the place of like, what were we comfortable with and what was feasible? And at the end, our leadership decided we could, um, you know, absorb the risk or float some of the costs for um, housing some of these folks for a couple of months, knowing that we'd get reimbursed later through the CARES Act funding. And this is where we eventually landed. We eventually landed in a space that let's move, let's test these things that we've been planning to see what works. Because when we go to scale, it's gonna be so much bigger that we need to work out some of the challenges. And um, people really were in the hotel, but for like three months by then, and they were, they were tired. <laughs> of being there and the staff really wanted to move people on. People wanted to go to housing, so we wanted to capitalize on that momentum. And so we decided that in June, we would test some of these things by housing up to 75 households from the Shielding Hotel. And the way that we have been planning to do that is through um, a housing event, which we're calling accelerated moving events. And so this is an intensive day of going through all of the steps needed to get into housing quickly. And so this event is, was at the hotel where people were living. We set up stations that people go through. So the first station was like a documentation station where we ensured that they had intake paperwork done. They had some of their documentations. We had them uh, put in HMIS. And then they moved on to a unit selection station where they were able to look at at least two units, but up to four and they could pick one of them and apply for them that day, do the background check that day, and do all of the housing process. Um, after that station, they were able to pick out furniture. We have a great partnership with the Chicago Furniture Bank, and folks could either pick a pre-selected set of furniture or other furniture that would be moved into their unit by the furniture bank before they moved in, for, again, for safety reasons. And the last station we had was an income station, because we're already recognizing that 
income was a barrier before, it's even a greater barrier now. And so folks could talk to someone about how to get um, access to SSI and SSDI through SOAR or how could they have access to employment. So, and when they completed those four stations, they were done with the accelerated moving event. And then um, the next day or so, we would assign them to case management with one of our um, partners in the community. So, you know, in June, we went through a lot of people. Um, but before that, the thing we really needed to like ramp up that we started to do um, because we hadn't really had centralized um, landlord engagement or unit identification in Chicago. So we had been working on that on a small scale in all Chicago, and then we had to really expand it to a large number of units because housing 75 people meant that we had to have between 100 and 120 you know, units available for people to have a little bit of choice and a little bit of um, flexibility in where they were going. So we rapidly expanded that to bring landlords on um, we started that work actually in April and we just kept having to move it down the line, but we um, were pretty successful with that. And so the data, so we're kind of 45 days in from when we started, our first event was on June 9th. Um, about 90% of the people that went through this, these events chose and applied for a unit. And then about 46% of them have already signed a lease. So you think that's a really great um, results of this, and then 27% of those um, were able to choose their unit. So uh, we think this is a really great um, success rate for this short amount of time, because our goal is to house people quickly. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things we really, um, of course, were concerned about was safety. And so like we worked really closely with um, the, the staff of the hotel, which was a medical provider to ensure safety for our event. We set up all of our stations to have like appropriate social distancing. Um, you know, everyone got their temperature taken from all Chicago because everyone was negative at the hotel. We didn't want to bring anything into that space. Um, we are all using uh, PPE, as you can see in this photo. Everyone was wearing a mask. Um, we were using hand sanitizer. We were doing all the things that the medical staff advised us to do. The one main thing we did was scheduling, and so. Um, we scheduled people to come down in small groups. So there were never too many people, and this is just one of the rooms that we used. We used multiple rooms. There were never too many people in a room for safety purposes. So we'd bring like six or seven people down at a time. We had a space that they needed to wait for any part of time so they could be um, at a distance from people as well. So these were some of the safety precautions um, we took into account. Um, next slide, please. And so then the lessons learned. So um, these are some of the things we're working through and we're trying to improve for when we go to scale, um, hopefully in September. Um, the first thing was something that Julie mentioned was trying to automate and systematize what they're doing, what you're doing. Um, so most people are going to this system in the same way and an expedient way, but then you also have capacity for exception. So the events really systematize the process of getting into housing, but then we did have capacity for exceptions. So some people just couldn't pick a unit on that day. And so, um, you know, we had them work with another case manager to identify a unit or a housing navigator, or um, if people, you know, really needed to see their unit, we, had, we did have the opportunity for them to go and see it if we needed to. But that was a really small percentage of the overall group. So we could address individual needs, but mostly things are really um, systematized. Um, the one really lesson that we learned was really clarifying the roles. I mean, because we didn't have enough resources to keep them apart, it kind of got murky sometimes of what navigators do versus what the unit identification team did versus what um, the, the service folks did, especially when we we're getting into like lease signing and moving in. And so what we're really doing is clarifying those roles and those who are involved in navigation are really just working with clients to get them through the process, the housing, I, the unit identification team is only working with the landlord so that the landlord has a single point of contact and then the services come later. So there's a really clear role distinction. Um, and again, with barriers, we're, we're, you know, some of the barriers, we're really trying hard to reduce those up front. Some of those are with landlords. So like, you know, reducing applications or fees or the need for identification. So having those, um, conversations about what can we reduce so that we can get more people moving um, faster. Um, and that really leads into limiting the number of landlords. And so with 120 
or so units, we really had like 60 to 70 landlords, and that's a lot to manage. And so one of our goals is to really target um, larger landlords and property owners. So we, we're reducing the number of landlords. We can make things more streamlined. Um, but we're also acknowledging like mom and pop landlords, they really are helpful to work with really challenging to house clients. And so we want to figure out ways to like streamline and standardize this small group of mom and pop landlords that we will keep using, like having one single application. We'll do the background check and, and other things, which leads us into what we really think will help us is um, holding fees. So being able to use um, private dollars to hold a unit um, so that it won't be leased from us. So my team who was doing a lot of the unit identification work, they felt like they were running a hamster wheel a little bit because they kept having to go back and call landlords over and over again because a unit was available on Monday and we had our event on Tuesday and by Wednesday, they had already leased it, right? And so a holding fee would help ensure that that, that unit was available. We also found that, you know, we had inspected and done rent reasonableness for units and then that exact unit was gone. And so then we had to start all over again. And so we feel that the holding fee can help resolve some of these things. Um, and the last thing I'd say was our lesson is when you plan anything, uh, we like to be able to like think of all the problems we're gonna have and solve for them um, in advance. And a lot of the things that we thought were gonna be problems and that Sometimes we solved for it and sometimes we were just like, oh, let's wait and see. They didn't end up being barriers at all. So the, the typical things you think of like people don't have IDs, they're not gonna get approved for units or they're not gonna get utilities turned on. I mean, at the end of the day, these ended up being more of our exceptions than what happened to everyone. And so we didn't really, um, you know, it wasn't really a barrier, right? It was just some things we had to negotiate with some of the landlords or some of the clients, you know, and things like that. So I would say like, make sure your barrier really is a barrier so you can get a systemic response to it. Um, and it's not just an exception for a few folks um, that need it. And that's all that I had. So I'll turn it back over to, to you, Norm. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, that's great stuff. And I, I have a question about looking for units. So I think a lot of people are wondering well, it's COVID time and social distancing and all this stuff. Did you have problems like with the actual process of like looking for units and like inspecting or, or just at least visually looking at units or working with landlords? How did that go? Uh, it, it was a little up and down. I mean, we, um, we, we didn't have problems locating units. We did sometimes have trouble um, inspecting them and doing that in person, like uh, because what else happened in Chicago, protests happened right before we were gonna start housing people. And so, you know, people didn't wanna go in the, the neighbor, in certain neighborhoods to, to inspect units, landlords weren't going in to view them. So we did a lot of virtual things and we set up systems to, to view things and do habitability um, virtually. So, um, you know, we, we were happy with the number of units we had, but you know, it was challenging. I'm not gonna say it wasn't challenging during COVID. And have you identified, have you started using holding fees? Uh, because I know the question that everybody wants to know is how you're paying for them. Yeah, um, so we haven't started using them, but we do have commitments from private dollars to use them. I mean, we, we really went through um, the, the thought process of it too, because you know it seems when you read the ESG reg, you could kind of do something like a holding fee through PBRA, right, and set up a rental agreement first, and but then you have to like really cross your fingers and hope you're going to get somebody in by the end of the month. And so we just felt like really getting the community behind us in this moment and saying, you know, if we really want to house people quickly together, we need your private dollars to help hold these units. So when we need somebody to move in, they're going to move in, and it's going to be fast, and we're going to reduce people's health risk. And so we did when we realized that holding fees was one of the answers, we really pushed the private private donor community to help us with that. That's great. Uh, so we have one last quick uh, presentation. I'm gonna turn things over to Marlisa Brogan from the SNAPS office, and she's gonna go through a few resources. Marlisa? Yes, hi, next slide, please. So as you're planning your rehousing strategy, um, one thought 
um, one of a number of thoughts in everyone's mind is how to fund how to fund it. And as there are a number of CARES Act resources out there, how to use them together. So one resource that's up on the HUD exchange is linked here in this slide. It's Federal Funding Priority Order for Non-Congregate Shelter During COVID-19. Take, take the time to go over it in detail. This is um, sort of a, a visual representation of the material covered in that resource. It takes you through sort of um, different phases of the process, starting with an initial request and implementation of non-congregate shelter during a public health emergency through uh, extensions of non-congregate shelter after the end of FEMA approved non -congregate the non-congregate sheltering project to transitioning individuals from non-congregate shelter and then finally winding down non-congregate shelter after FEMA public assistance ends. So the general flow of how to use your, these various resources and this specific document um, highlights Three, Pub FEMA, Public Assistance, Category B, CDBG, CV, so the CARES Act funding for the CDBG program, and the Emergency Solutions Grants CARES, um, CARES funding, or ESG CV. So in the initial phase, you, um, you, the community would use FEMA, Public Assistance, Category B first, followed by either CDBG, CV, or ESG CV. And then in the second phase, um, when you're extending non-congregate shelter and your FEMA-approved um, non-congregate sheltering project is, has ended, in other words, FEMA assistance is, um, is, is concluded, then you would follow up any extension of non-congregate shelter with either CDBG-CV or CDBG-CV. And then um, in, the next, in the next phase, when you're transitioning people out of non-congregate shelter, so you're moving them, your, your rehousing plan is in place, and you're, um, you're actively finding housing for those who are in non-congregate shelter, you, in general, want to use your ESG CV funding first for rental assistance, and then follow it up with CDBG CV, just because this is what ESG CV is typically used for. Um, you know, recipients are used to using ESG CV. It's what the ESG program does well, and then once you once you um, exhaust that funding or the funding you've budgeted for that, then it makes sense to follow that up with CDBG CV. And then as you're winding down non-congregate sheltering, after um, after FEMA public assistance ends, again, like you'd want to use ESG CV first and then follow it up with with CDBG CV. This is not a required order of assistance, but um, it's it's in general what what we would recommend as the as the order what what typically makes sense based on um, the activities that ESG is is good and good at covering um, with flexibility and then um, following it up with CDBG. Next slide, please. And then before we turn it over to um, just a few remaining minutes of Q and A, we want to make sure that you all are taking away the key points that we really wanted to emphasize, which are first that communities and programs, they're, they're continuing to implement infection control measures following CDC guidelines. This is so critical um, and you know the, the rate of infection is not letting up, so now more than ever it's, it's so important to keep, keep vigilant, keep the infection control measures in place and keep on top of CDC guidelines and any updates that, um, that, they, that they present. Um, next, important work remains to increase the outflow from temporary housing in unsheltered settings. So, um, you know, people need to get out of, a, a, people need a rehousing plan to be able to move from non-congregate sheltering settings. This is um, a a critical essential component of non-congregate sheltering and um, making sure that people are not returning to unsheltered settings or congregate shelter settings. And finally, um, we at HUD plan to continue these peer exchanges and presenting community examples and also um, continuing to communicate with you all through office hours and additional um, resources on the HUD exchange. With that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Norm. 
Uh, thanks, Marlisa. And I just wanted to get one more question in. Uh, going back to Shenandoah, you were talking about, we had some questions about possessions uh, and how you handle that. Because again, like the, I don't know what the technical term for it is, but the transmission through like surfaces and things like that is, is something to be uh, concerned about. Can you talk about what did you guys do to help prevent the, uh, that kind of transmission? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I know that I heard from colleagues that um, there, there is thorough, there's partner uh, coordination with city partners to really be uh, diligent on um, cleaning, um, doing thorough cleanings of the of the shelter on the congregate sites. Um, in terms of possession, I really can't speak to that. Um, I know that we do have um, lockers at PHPW um, for personal belongings. Um, I'm not clear if there was a change uh, due to COVID that was uh, implemented. Great, thank you. And I know someone in the chat box suggested or uh, mentioned that their program or a program they were familiar with had switched to a bin system where people had individualized individual bins that they could keep uh, their possessions under their bed. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's the strategy that works. Uh, so I want to, our time has ended, so I wanted to thank everyone for uh, spending your time with us. Uh, especially wanted to thank our community uh, presenters, uh, Shenandoah, Lauren, Joel, Karen, you guys were fantastic. Thank you so much uh, both for innovating and for sharing your uh, learnings with us today. I uh, definitely also want to thank our uh, technical assistance providers who helped us out today, Anne and Julie, uh, and thank the SNAP staff, uh, Marlisa, and thank you, Rebecca, for joining us from CDC. Uh, always appreciate the great information you provide to our audience. Uh, so thank you all for joining the webinar today. And uh, again, we hope to have many more of these in the future. If you have topics you'd like for us to uh, uh, present on, please share those with us. Uh, and also, if you have things to share that you feel like have worked in your community, we'd love to hear about that. Uh, we're, uh, uh, I know people are craving uh, hearing from their peers in other communities. So uh, please share it with us anything uh, that you find that uh, has worked well for you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining and uh, hope you have a great rest of the day, rest of the week. And that concludes the webinar.